everybody. I have with me today Margie Edwards. Margie is a member of the Hoosier Hillsides Master Gardeners, and she raises monarch butterflies. So she's going to talk a little bit about that today. Margie, why don't you start with telling us how you got started raising butterflies? Thanks, Abby. <laughs> no problem. I got started about 10 years ago when I took a Master Gardener's class and a lot of the Master Gardener, a lot of the classes to be honest were kind of boring but when Ray Weatherholt came in and did a presentation on butterflies I got hooked. He, he gave each of us some milkweed seeds and I took them home. This was in March and I took them home and planted them in June and I planted them in two flower pots and I went out one day and the milkweed was growing and I thought yay I'm a gardener and then uh, went out checked a bit later and all the plants in one of the pots was just sheared off to the bottom and I got pretty upset those darn deer in the yard again and then I remembered deer don't eat milkweed so I walked over and looked at the other pot, and I found the culprit, and there was a nice little cat, fat caterpillar. And I got so excited, and I took him in the house, picked off the leaf he was on, took him in the house, put him in a glass cookie jar and put a cover on it, and then I went to Google. And so I, I researched on what to do and how to do it. And when that little booger changed into a chrysalis, that was the most exciting thing, and when it became a butterfly, it was even more exciting. I've been hooked ever since. Now, why raise monarchs? Well, why not? It is fun. It is a lot of fun. Kids really get into it, adults get into it, but they kind of contain their excitement a little bit. Now, these are kids obviously enjoying them. When the monarchs first hatch out, they're pretty easygoing and they'll let you hold them for a little bit and then they get braver and they take off. So more people enjoying the butterflies. It's educational. Now I'm a retired teacher so when I come across something exciting that I think kids would learn, I gotta have kids. So, and I've got a few schools that are kind enough to let me come in with my butterfly show. And I've never left a hap an unhappy kid yet. Here's, I've gone, I've taught anywhere from uh, preschoolers to high schoolers. Wore my grandkids out going to school, I think. It's not only fun and it's educational, it's both at the same time. And to have a little kindergartner with a thousand watt smile say, this is the best day of my life, just means a lot. And then finally, the third reason, it may help increase the monarch's population. When I first started doing this 10 years ago, I was going to single-handedly save the whole monarch population, you know, well, of course, that wasn't realistic, <laughs> wasn't even smart. But uh, this chart shows the, how the population has changed over the last, since 1995. It's gone up and it's gone down and it's gone way down. And this is measured by hectares in the Mexican forest where the monarchs hang out all winter. So the last, this ends in 2015, the last couple of years in Mexico, it's been up a little. In California, it's the pits right now. Now, if you raise monarchs inside, cleanliness is essential. There's no shortcuts to that. I use a lot of bleach. I found Lysol is not a good idea, but bleach works. <laughs> So I will bleach, rinse, and dry the containers that I'm going to put them in. Wash and dry the milkweed leaves. 
I pick a lot at one time so I'm not running out every day getting fresh leaves. And I will wash it and dry it and then store it in airtight containers in the refrigerator and then dry the leaves before I feed them. It's very important to wash your hands before and after you touch the leaves, the caterpillars, the chrysalises, the butterflies. It's better to not touch anything. The chrysalises are, the, are okay after they harden, but you've got to be careful. And it's very important to avoid touching your face after you've touched milkweed, especially your eyes. That can cause severe damage. So wash your hands. And if you have a, a group of cats in the same container and one of them dies, you need to get that dead one out of there. You need to move the others to a different container and give them new leaves and then then bleach the container before you use it again. Now here I have a couple of butterfly eggs. They're on the bottom side of the leaf. And I like this picture. She looks like she's on top. I mean, she is on top of the leaf, but she wiggles her bottom around under the leaf so that the egg comes out on the, on the bottom. And you can also see an egg up here on the stem. Each female produces anywhere from three to five hundred eggs in a, her one to three month lifespan. She usually puts one egg on the underside of the leaf, but not always. I like it better when she puts them on the top side because then I don't have to look as hard, but they're not usually that cooperative. She only deposits eggs on milkweed. And that way, when the caterpillar emerges, it has food to eat. And three to five days after the egg is deposited, the caterpillar will come out and turn around and eat its shell. And after that, its job is just to eat and grow and eat and grow. Now, as I said, the milkweed is the, the caterpillar's only food. This is a picture of a red tropical milkweed. The caterpillar's eating away on it. I don't take all my eggs inside. I try to raise some inside and leave a lot outside. So if you decide to do this, I'm not saying my way is the only way. I'm saying my way is the way that works for me. You can use any container. I put about five eggs in a little Ziploc. It's a half cup container. Put the lid on it with no air holes. And it takes, a, well, I said three to five days. So I put five in there. I look at them each day, but I don't mess with them. And after they hatch, then I still leave them in there a couple of days before I put any new milkweed in. And then I will give them a, a little milkweed. Uh, they don't eat much at first, so without touching them, then when I'm ready to clean this, I will pull the leaf out that it's on, lay the leaf aside, then take a little paintbrush and brush all the extra out, all the frass out and then put the leaf back in and put a new leaf in there and let it go. When the caterpillars get to be about a third of an inch long, I'll take them out of that container and move them up to a larger container. And I have air holes poked in this one. I took a uh, ice pick and poked it from the inside so that the rough edge is on the outside. So if the caterpillar is in there, it's not going to tear its skin off on, on the, that. And I'll leave all five in here for a week or so, and then they start getting big. And then I will take a couple of them out and put in another container and not overcrowd them. Then when they get to be about 
an inch and a half long and a little bit fat, then I'm going to move them into an aquarium. I put a paper towel in the bottom of the aquarium. Here I, I have small containers back behind that. I don't know if you can see it. And if you can tell up on the screen, there are chrysalises hanging. So I let them go ahead and do their morphing and they end up as a chrysalis. I let the chrysalis harden a while and then I'm going to move them. And here's a, these are just about ready to finish their process as a caterpillar, I mean. So the caterpillars are going to eat and grow for 10 to 14 days. They're going to shed their skin uh, four times as they grow. And they eat the old skin. And the period of time between sheddings is called eclose. So this one is looking pretty big. Now after the fourth shedding, life gets interesting, especially out in the wild, because the caterpillar is going to eat like mad for about a day, and then it's just going to stop. And if you're not sure what's going on, you're going to worry. Oh, I've, I've killed it. I've killed it. Well, no, after it rests a while, it's going to start wandering and find a place that it likes. And then it's going to hang down, uh, make itself a little silk hold fast and drop down. This has been fun at our house, looking for the caterpillars and the chrysalises that are outside. Sometimes even inside they escape. We ended up having a chrysalis hanging in the door frame. And this one found the candy bowl that doesn't hold candy. It's a newly jade. It's all tight. As it gets older, it's going to drop down. Now, outside, it's been like Easter for the last I mean, this is early October. For the last couple of weeks, we have found chrysalises hanging on lawn chairs, under benches, on garden statues. We found them. We have a water tank that's parked out uh, by the garden, and there were four on each tire. There was the lawn chair leaning against it. There were four on that. There was a scarecrow leaning against it. There was one on the scarecrow's belly. We found them on the swimming pool. We one day, uh, my husband came in and said, would you move the chrysalis off the John Deere? I need to use the tractor. Strange places, and it's fun, but in the house they're kind of contained, so unless they're lucky enough to escape like this one did, I can always find them. Now, after the caterpillar sheds its skin once more, then it becomes a chrysalis. And I'm going to show you a little bit of how that works. If you're lucky enough, enough to catch this happening, it's really a fascinating thing to watch. The uh, chrysalis now has to, the caterpillar has to get out of his skin, his old skin. And a caterpillar's body is longer than a butterfly's body. So we've got to have some shrinkage going on there. And then on the inside, there are all sorts of processes that are going to be happening for the next two weeks. So a lot of changes have to be made. But the caterpillar coming out of the skin, that last skin, is just fun. You're going to watch it do a whole lot of wiggling. And that's kind of to shrink it up and rearrange things on the inside. And it's hilarious to watch. It's called the wiggle dance. And when you're doing this with kids, you want to encourage them to, to do the wiggle dance because it's so much fun. You can see the stripes from the caterpillar still. Those are eventually going to disappear. It's just a gooey jelly mess right now. And this is a really... Uh, precarious time for it out in the wild because if anything touches it, it may kill it. You know, if a bee gets it, a uh, spider decides it's hungry, anything can destroy it at this point. And that's a seriously hard piece of silk that it's attached itself to.
tough piece of silk, I should say. Another time that's really, really dangerous is when the butterfly comes out of its chrysalis because there, it has no way of defense. It's estimated that, depending on your source, only one or three or five or maybe even 10% of monarch eggs ever make it to a full-fledged monarch. This is a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. It's not a good picture. And I apologize for all the pictures on here because I'm not a patient photographer. And I tried to use my own pictures. It's hanging onto the chrysalis as it comes out. It comes out all folded up and looking really strange. And the wings are just a wrinkled up mess and the abdomen part is really fat. And all this struggling it's doing is helping make it stronger. It has to come out of the chrysalis by itself because each movement is going to make it a little bit stronger. And if, if you're a helpful soul who wants to help it get out there, you've just killed your caterpillar or your butterfly. So anyway, the wings are really shriveled up and the abdomen is really big. And the ab abdomen is full of fluid and it pumps the fluid out of its abdomen into the wings. So the belly shrinks up and the wings get bigger and I sure wish we could do that. So I'm gonna let him go ahead and develop and move on to the next one. Here we have one fully out and one still filling those wings up. It takes several hours for it to dry good enough to release. But the good news is you've got up to 24 hours. They don't, supposedly don't eat up to 24 hours, for 24 hours. I usually go ahead and let them, if they come out early in the day, I'll let them dry and then I'll go ahead and release them in the afternoon. But if they come out in the evening, I'll wait until the next morning. It needs to be between 55 and 60 degrees to let them go or higher. Just another picture of the same thing happening. So it takes four, 10 to 14 days, and late in the season like this, this is October, it's closer to 14 or it could be even longer. What I have done here is I took the chrysalises after they had hardened out of the, off the screen and moved them over to medicine cabinets that we uh, changed a little bit, and, and I used a cool hot glue and glued them up there. And then you can watch them as they get closer to being finished. They, the chrysalises will turn dark, and then you think, oh, it's dead, I've ruined it. And sometimes it is, but usually it, the dead means that the chrysalis is, that the butterfly is coming out, that you're just seeing more of it. If you can tell on here, the uh, there are gold flecks. There's a little, like a little crown around the side, the, the top, I mean, of gold flecks, and there's some more down at the bottom. And those are actually air pockets so that the developing butterfly can still breathe while it's in there, which is pretty cool, and that adds beauty to it. So just more hanging and drying. Uh, got a mail here. If you see those dots, those uh, little black dots down there, that's a sign of a male. Plus the veins are thinner. The uh, those black dots don't do anything on the monarch. On the related butterflies, those are olfactory glands, so they can can uh, smell each other and won't waste their time going after the wrong gender. Now, notice how much darker her veins are than his. And there's really no size 
variation, you know, males, females about the same size. There's a variation in the one butterfly to another, but not in the male, female. And then finally the release, which is a happy time for them. Kids don't really like it. <laughs> they want to play with them and talk to them. I have the best luck with zinnias and also lantanas as nectar food. They're colorful. The butterflies are really attracted to color. One year, I looked out under the apple tree and there were dead apples on the ground and I saw monarchs eating the rotten fruit and I thought, I've never seen that before. So it wasn't until I took the picture in, put it on the camera, that I realized those monarchs are viceroys. They've got a line right through there and the configuration's a little bit different. And that's a form of mimicry that the monarchs are toxic and by copying that, the viceroys are safer, except that now they've decided that viceroys have some toxicity too, just not as much. But anyway, I've never seen another viceroy at my house, and I'd really like to. Okay, as I said before, the monarch population is on its way down. What scientists are really worried about is that the monarch migration will go extinct. There are monarchs that live all season in southern Florida and, and in the warm, in the tropics and the like, but they don't migrate. They just, they're there. So there's a lot of inbreeding and disease is more rampant. So we want to save the monarch migration. Well, this shows the paths that they take. Uh, all of them east of the Rockies are considered eastern monarchs, and they all head down to the same area in Mexico. And no one has really figured out exactly why, but it happens. Now on the west coast, the western monarchs all head to the west coast, California and down to the Baja, and uh, those are really in trouble because of the forest fires that have been plaguing the area in the last few years. So four generations of monarchs are produced each year. People think the monarchs migrate. Yay, the same ones go down and come back, and it just happens over and over. Well, not quite. It takes four generations a year. So if we start over winter in Mexico, the mating is going to happen in February and March, maybe in northern Mexico, southern Texas. And then they'll fly a bit and lay their eggs and that's it for them. Uh, the first generation goes farther north, lays their eggs, and that's it. If they like where they are in the meantime, they don't have to fly north, but it's just uh, they do. And so the next generations continue. And when the weather begins to cool in the fall, this fourth generation will be heading south. And that's the ones we are seeing now in October and late September. The migration gets really pick, picks up steam in late September, and we still have a few stragglers. Journeynorth.org is an organization that you can go and, and you can uh, record your sightings. And this chart shows how the, the generations go. And we get second generation, if we're lucky, we get a lot, of, a lot of third generation. And then, of course, by the time all the third generations are through, then we have the fourth generation coming through. The interesting thing about uh, the generations is the first three generations start out ready to reproduce and move on. I mean, they're fully developed. But the fourth generation doesn't have all of its parts running yet. So they can't reproduce. They're like a pre-adolescent thing. But the good thing is all their energy then is tied up in getting ramped up to fly that up to 3,000 miles to south. And after they overwinter in the 
OML fir trees in the mountains of Mexico, then they develop the ability to reproduce and they have at it, thankfully. Uh, reasons the monarchs are dwindling in number. A big reason is people, accidentally, probably, uh, we cut down their habitat. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, run over them in traffic, especially the migrators, because they can't tell what's dangerous and what's not. Really, the biggest thing is loss of habitat because we, we see weeds, we got to cut them down. Got to make the world beautiful, so cut down those weeds. But those milkweeds need to be out there. Weather is a big problem. Uh, if spring is extremely wet in Texas, we're not going to get as many later on. If there are fires in Texas, same deal. Of course, in California, we're seeing what's happening. Insects are a problem. Everything must like monarch eggs. <laughs> I must taste good. I have a fight every summer with aphids, yellow, soft-bodied aphids. Get on the milkweed, suck the juices out. I don't have enough food. There's a, there are more bugs, real colorful bugs called milkweed bugs. <laughs> I'm sure they have a better name than that, but that's what I call them. And they suck the life out of the seed pods. Herbicides and pesticides would be self-explanatory. If you kill the weeds, you don't have the food. And pesticides will kill the, if you spray those aphids with anything except water, you're going to kill the, the uh, caterpillars. So what can we do? Well, mainly, plant native milkweed and nectar plants. Skip the use of pesticides. Create a monarch way station. Join in the fight to stop climate change. Learn more. Spread the word. Don't mold the milkweed off the side of the road. <laughs> Don't mold the milkweed between the interstate lanes. Don't clean up your garden too early in the fall. You may not disturb the monarchs, but you may disturb other things. So just be careful when you're doing that. I finished all the green beans I wanted. I wanted to go out and pull up the plants. There are caterpillars and chrysalises in there. So the green beans didn't get pulled up when they should have. Monarchwatch.org has taught me so much. I have my own way station. Uh, get the information from them. You can buy their sign. You can buy seeds from them. They expect you to have so many nectar plants, and they'll tell you what. Some suggested nectar plants. These aren't the ones that research are going to tell you to get exclusively. I say leave your early spring dandelions. And the reason I say that is one year we had a monarch in April. There was nothing to eat. I happened to walk out to check my garden because that's what we do to see where the milkweed was. Well, they were up about this tall. And there was a very tired looking monarch out there. And she had nothing, absolutely nothing to eat. Well, I had just happened to have overwintered a couple of milkweed plants, and they were blooming, a couple of tropicals. And I ran in the house and grabbed a pot of blooming milkweed. I took it out there and got as close to her as I could, and I set it down. She found it. I went away. I went back toward the end of the day when it started getting cool, because this was April. Took it in, and I found 20, or 20 eggs on that plant. The next day I walked out the door and something flew by my head and landed and she had buzzed me and hit the ground and she was so tired she could not get up. I ran in, got the other plant, I picked her up, which you normally can't do when they're, they're on their own, put her on the plant, she filled her tummy, I left the plant, when I took it in that night I found ten more eggs. 
That night it turned really cold. I never saw anything for two weeks. But she shouldn't have been there that early. There were a, a, a lot of winds coming up from the south, and I think she just got caught in one. And uh, <laughs> Anyway, I started early that season. <laughs> Luckily, I had plants growing in the greenhouse, so I was able to feed those as they came out. And that was pretty cool. Milkweed, you got to have, I have, uh, we have common growing quite a few places out in our fields. We have swamp orange butterfly weed, which are, are all perennials. They don't use the swamp or the butterfly weed as much for their eggs until that last burst before winter, then they'll use it. But they, I strongly recommend orange butterfly weeds just for everything nectars off of it. Lantana, all kinds of butterflies are in my lantana constantly. Like I said, zinnias, cone flowers, they love uh, goldenrod, cleomies, and they like other things too. And you really, probably don't want to just focus on monarchs. If you're a, mon a butterfly lover, you want to research, find out what other kinds of butterflies like and plant those things too. I just focus mainly on the, on the monarchs. Now here's some examples. Here's common milkweed. This was just a couple weeks ago, so you can see how wild it is around there. But this got cut down and it's growing again. And then here are seed pods for the old from the old balloon milkweed is one of the most interesting ones. It's a tropical. I grow this in my greenhouse. It has little white flowers. It's not all that beautiful to look at except for the seed pods, which are interesting. But I find most of my eggs on the balloon because it's easy. They lay them, the, the, uh, they're like a bunch of little branches and the plants get really tall, and they'll lay them their eggs up high. And that makes it a lot simpler for me, being an old lady. Tropical milkweed, we also grow in our greenhouse. This is, the blooms look a lot like lantana, but the caterpillars will eat this, and they won't eat the lantana. Passion vine smells heavenly. I don't grow it just for the, for the monarchs. I grow it for a type of little fritillary that's really cool, too. makes a neat chrysalis. And, of course, the zinnias, good old-fashioned old zinnias. Goldenrods right now are a lifesaver for a lot of the migrators. And the wild asters, which I don't have pictures of. And, of course, they'll stand by lantana. Everything likes lantana. Now, if you are going to do this for your personal use, you might want to look at the butterfly, the family butterfly book. When I do these in schools, this is my favorite, kids' favorite book. It's Gotta Go, Gotta Go with Sam Swope. And it starts out for, with, as an egg, and it goes all the way through its process and goes to Mexico and then starts back. And even when I talked to fourth graders who heard the book when they were in first grade, they want to hear Gotta Go again, but I don't usually do that. Monarch and Milkweed is another good one, resource. And I can't recommend this too highly. It's a YouTube video by David Britton. It's a time elapsed whole butterfly metamorphosis story set to music. And you can download it for free on YouTube. Just Google David Britton and Butterfly Complete Metamorphosis. And I watch this over and over. It's just fabulous. It's so cool. My resources, I learned, have learned a lot from all three, four of these places. I like this picture because on the, the uh, balloon milkweed, there's a caterpillar. There he is. 
and a butterfly back there both. So enjoy your monarchs. And thank you for being a captive audience. <laughs> Be brave and try it yourself. Yep.